missed one. Even the year I broke my leg playing football was just a few days before Easter. I didn't miss preaching on Friday or Easter Sunday. I told the doctors they had to wait to do the surgery until after Easter. I had to preach on Easter Sunday. So using crutches to balance me while standing behind the pulpit, I preached that Easter. 37 years. 37 sermons. So, and every year my routine for preparing for that sermon has been pretty much the same. For 37 years to prepare for the Easter sermon, I'd always read each gospel account numerous times during the week, and I'd read 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul talks about our faith being futile if Christ had not been raised from the dead, but he has indeed. I read all about the scriptures that talk about the times that the resurrected Jesus appeared to different people. Honestly, I didn't think there was any part of that I didn't know. But this year, I found something I didn't know. Or if I did know it, I forgot. Now, the scripture tells us that the resurrected Jesus appeared to over 521 people. You can check my number if you want and see if you come up with the same number. The resurrected Jesus appeared to over 521 people. Some of those people, he appeared multiple times. Paul, when writing to the Christ followers in the Corinthian church, said, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he... After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some had fallen asleep, meaning they had died. Then he appeared to James, to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So according to Paul's words and my calculation, the resurrected Jesus appeared to 521 people. Now we know the first person Jesus appeared to was Mary Magdalene in the cemetery. And the other women who were with her, remember? Mary, the mother of Jesus, Lomi, Joanne, we, we all know that, right? And then he appeared again to Mary Magdalene when, when she mistook Jesus as, as the caretaker at the cemetery. She thought he had done something with the body, and, and she thought he had moved it someplace. And so she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him. I'll get him. And it wasn't until Jesus spoke her name. She was so familiar with his voice, that she looked up and she realized it was her. she was looking at the resurrected Jesus and in awe she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, the too good to be true, was true. The next one's Jesus appeared with Cleopas and another Christ follower on their way back to Luke tells us about them. They were so distraught. They were so disappointed. They were so disillusioned by Jesus' death. They had really, really believed he was the promised Messiah. They even said, hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But that hope, that, that fire in the belly, that belief was quickly doused. Quickly doused when, when they saw him crucified on Friday. And they saw him die. And they knew he was laid in a borrowed tomb. They knew he was dead. And they were absolutely lost in their grief. So, so much so, they no longer had any hope at all. That There wasn't even the smallest spark of hope within them. They were so lost in their grief that they didn't even realize it was the resurrected Jesus walking with them and talking with them and explaining scripture to them about how the Messiah had to suffer and die. That They didn't realize who it was. And invited him into the and they broke bread together, and all of a sudden, he realized it was the resurrected Jesus. Too good to be true was true. So they immediately went back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they had seen Jesus. And while all the disciples were gathered together in a room, except for doubting Thomas, Jesus, for the first time, appeared to the disciples on that Sunday evening. And for at least 37 years as a pastor... That's what I thought. Jesus appeared to Mary and the women and then to Cleopas and his friends and, and then the 12 on Sunday evening. But I skipped right over something that Luke told us about 
who the resurrected Jesus appeared to. Dr. Luke, Luke the historian, Luke who checked and double checked all the facts before he wrote this life. Luke the one who told Theophilus who he was writing to. Therefore, since I myself have carefully invested it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And I not only skipped what Luke wrote, but somehow I skipped right over what Paul had written to the Corinthians. I had read it many times, but at least 37 years in a row. And I skipped right over it. Both Luke and Paul told us of another resurrection appearance that I never saw in all the times I read the gospel account. I don't think I was ever taught it in four years of college and three years of seminary. Now, I can't guarantee that, that I wasn't taught it, because I could have been sleeping or I could have been skipping or simply gazing at the most beautiful girl on the campus of Olivet Nazarene University, Terry Suzanne Webster. I did a whole lot of that back then. <laughs> Still do it. <laughs> been mentioned, probably was, but I don't remember it being mentioned. And I don't ever remember hearing a sermon preached about it but it's right there Luke the historian tells us about it Paul tells us about it look it up Luke chapter 24 verse 33 it says he got up Cleopas and his friend they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem there they found the those with them assembled together and saying it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. And Paul, when telling who Jesus appeared to, to the Corinthians, said to them, he appeared to Peter. And then to the twelve. Did you catch it? First Cleopas said, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. I'm assuming that's but Matthew, Mark, or John, they don't tell us that the resurrected Jesus appeared to Simon Peter or any other Simon. He appeared in that room on that Sunday evening. And Paul also told us that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. So evidently, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Simon before that Sunday evening. And evidently, Simon had told Cleopas and the other guy before they had left Jerusalem to go back to Emmaus, Peter told them about seeing Jesus. Why else would they say? It's true, he appeared to Simon. How would they know that if Simon hadn't told them? And why didn't any of the gospel writers tell us about the encounter between Jesus and Peter? I've got my theory. You knew I would. Mark, who, who probably received his information about Jesus from Peter before writing his gospel, who tells us that when the angel saw Mary and the other women at the tomb that morning, he said to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then he said, this is so important. But go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You see, I think Peter was so overwhelmed with guilt and shame after the crucifixion that he didn't feel like a disciple any longer. Guilt over cutting the ear off of Melchizedek and Jesus rebuking him. Shame over the fact that he did nothing to stop Judas when Jesus told him it was Judas who was going to be the betrayer. Guilt for he even knew Jesus, let alone was one of his disciples, and once, but three times. Shame over the fact that he cursed. He didn't know Jesus, and not to some big burly guy who was going to arrest him, but to a little servant girl. Guilt and shame over the fact that he her denial. Every vile and disgusting word Peter had used to prove he wasn't a disciple. And, and, and we're told in the scripture right at that very moment, Jesus looked right at Peter after that vile denial. Luke's the one who gave us that little detail. He wrote, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. So evidently, Jesus was being led from one trial to the next at that very moment when Peter was spewing. 
It says, Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. I think Peter was overwhelmed with guilt and shame. Guilt over the fact he wasn't at the cross with John and Mary as Jesus was crucified and then died. Shame that he wasn't the one who asked for Jesus' body to bury it. I think Peter was so overwhelmed with guilt and shame and felt like he didn't even deserve to be called to die. And maybe even the other disciples were thinking that of Peter also. Maybe Peter didn't feel like a disciple, and maybe the disciples didn't look on Peter as a disciple after his denials. Whatever the case, the angel specifically said to those women, go tell the disciples and Peter. And Luke and Paul both let us know that somewhere on that day, Jesus appeared to Simon, just Simon, one-on-one, before he appeared to all the other disciples. Here's my theory. I think it was because Jesus wanted to make sure Peter knew he was a God of second chances and third chances. and t- He was the God of great, undeserved mercy and grace. And so in the midst of Peter's shame and guilt, the resurrected Jesus came to him, just him, and said, Peter, I forgive you. I'll give you a second chance. Peter, what I said before is still true. You're the rock I'm going to build my church upon. And Peter, this whole deal about the cross, all of it, that's God's plan. What you did or didn't do, you didn't cause it. It was God's plan. It's been my plan from the beginning. And if I can forgive you, you need to forgive yourself and start. You're still my disciple. I still have plans for you. And you know what? I think there are so many people on this Easter Sunday who need to hear that message. The cross was all part of God's plan. And if he has forgiven you, you need to forgive yourself. No matter what your past has included, no matter how great the failure, no matter how deep the sin. I know Wendy McDonald needed to hear it because she told me she did. Wendy had no church background, spiritual background at all. I don't think she was in church in her entire life. She was a partier. Her, her husband had recently died because of the way he used his own body for years. Her son was in jail. Her house was being for her She had lost her job to top it all off. She had taken prescription painkillers and then got in a car to drive someplace. But because she was high, she was the cause of a car accident where another lady was killed. Wendy happened to have a daughter who lived in Alaska, and that daughter was a Christ follower, and for many, many years, she'd been praying for her mom. Wendy also happened to have a neighbor who was a Christ follower, and this neighbor attended our church in Union Lake. And, and in the wake of everything going on in her life, this neighbor asked Wendy if she'd like to come to church with her, and for the first time in her life, she walked through the doors of a church. And I gotta tell you, Wendy couldn't get enough church. She loved everything about it. She loved singing, she loved the preaching, she loved Bible study. She was there every time the doors were open. The more but she said she, she just couldn't. She couldn't forgive herself, she said, for all the things that she had done. She carried this, this incredible guilt with her. It weighed her down. It colored everything in her life. She, she couldn't believe she did what she did. She went to trial. She was convicted, was sentenced she wasn't angry at God. She knew justice was being served. Each week, I would mail her a paper sermon I'd preached the Sunday before. After I sent the copy of the sermon I preached on Easter of that year, she wrote me back. This is part of what she wrote. Dear Pastor Fred, Easter sermon touched me. Your sermon, something special to me in your Easter sermon. You reminded us of the words of Jesus and what he did for us. Then you said... I can't tell you the number of people who because they are consumed with guilt and their past and their own failures and sin. That's me. I had asked God to forgive me a thousand times, but I hadn't forgiven myself. I've beaten myself up, but now 
through Jesus, I can forgive myself. I do, I will obey what he has commanded. Let me tell you, my persuasive words that convinced her of anything, it, that didn't change her heart and mind. But the power of the Holy Spirit came to the jail cell and changed her in a moment. It was authentic. Her guilty was cleansed. She was trained in that. The burden of guilt and shame was lifted. And just as the resurrected Jesus came to Peter in the midst of his guilt and shame, and just as the Holy Spirit came to Wendy McDonald in the midst of her guilt and shame, listen, he will come to you. How will you respond when he offers you a second chance or a 100th chance? How will you respond when he offers you mercy, not giving you after what you did? How will you respond to his amazing grace? Paul said something to important to grab a hold of. He wrote, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you take your stand. By this gospel, you, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on as of first importance. And we need to stop there and before we look at what Paul said, the first importance. We need to grab a hold of that peculiar Greek he used there. The word he used there that's translated first wasn't the word he would have used if he was talking about a number on the first day of the week or when I came to visit you the first time. But the word Paul purposely used, first importance, means supreme. Absolutely the foremost, supreme, the most important thing you can believe. There is nothing more else that compares with this belief. There is nothing more important than this belief. Every other belief is built upon this It's what is the foundation of faith. It's the first importance. And then he goes on and states what that, that we must believe because it will make a difference when there's something that's blocking our vision from seeing to Jesus. For what I received, I passed on as of first importance. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried on the third day according to the scriptures, appeared to Peter and the 12, and after that, he appeared to more than 100 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then as to one abnormally born. Folks, what you and I believe about the death and resurrection of Jesus is of first importance. It's what will make the difference. It's what made the difference to Peter when he was trapped in shame and he couldn't believe he did what he had done. And he sure didn't feel like a disciple any longer. But when the resurrected Jesus came to him and he really believed Jesus was alive, that this was all part of God's amazing plan of redemption, I believe he could also finally begin to forgive himself and that God still had a plan for his life. His failure, as great as he thought it was, was not fatal. His failure was not fatal. And listen, our belief, our, our faith, where, when there is something, anything that is stopping you and me from seeing the and believing what he wants to do in our lives, when we have a past that still haunts us, when we c continue to carry around this incredible or guilt or Overwhelmed and disappointed because God didn't do what we thought he would do. It can be that failure or that addiction or that betrayal or that disease or the darkness of depression. It, it can be great grief over the death of someone we love so deeply. Grief over the relationship. It can be a destructive lifestyle. It can be anything that stops us from seeing the resurrected Jesus believing what he wants to do in our life and what he can do in our life Right now. Listen, he not only forgives sin, he can bring the power of sin in your life. He can free you from what has entrapped you. 
He can bring real transformation. You thought you could never change? I'm telling you, he can change you. You have to stay the way you are. He can transform you by the renewing of your mind and how you think, by the cleansing of your And this is the best part. You understand, you don't have to come to him. You don't have to find him. You, you don't have to search for him because he will come to you and offer you forgiveness or He'll offer transformation, transform you into a new creation in Christ. Just as he came to Peter sometime on that Sunday, the resurrected Jesus will come to you. In fact, the resurrected Jesus is coming to you. He's coming to you. You realize he's coming to you in this very moment. Why not receive what he's offering you today? Why not make that decision that I believe Jesus was resurrected from the dead and I can experience his resurrection power in my life that he is offering a new life, a fresh start, a, a second chance. Why not believe I don't have to be stuck in that cesspool of guilt and shame and defeat and death. The too good to be true can be true for you because he is risen and death has been defeated. How will you respond when Jesus comes to you? We have three people who want to testify to the fact that they, they not only believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but that the resurrected Jesus has come to them and have saved them and have given them new life. I, I'm going to dismiss them to go and get ready. Baptize them. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Ba baptism is an opportunity to let everyone know that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. They've been forgiven of sin, and they're following him as Lord and Savior. And, and baptism is meant to be a time of celebration, all of us celebrating together, celebrating the new life a person has, celebrating the promise of heaven awaits all the followers, celebrating they've been transformed into a new creation in Christ. So we're going to baptize these today and that want they have been saved, they have a new life, and, and we're going to celebrate. So let's stand together in a moment and begin the celebration by we'll have the privilege of seeing these baptized.